Okay, we're going to talk about sociolinguistics uh, this week. Today we'll especially talk about dialects and related issues. And then uh, next time we'll get more into some of the uh, stuff that's maybe not in the books and the power dynamics involved in language and society and culture. So we've uh, talked about prescriptive rules and descriptive rules. And as linguists, we don't believe in prescriptive rules. For one thing, uh, there are different dialects and varieties of a language and languages change. And next week we're going to start talking about language change. Languages change over time. Uh, the first kind of prescriptive grammars for English were written in the UK starting in the 1700s. Uh, and as we'll learn later, the English language was undergoing quite a lot of change. It always has been actually. Grammatical changes, changes in vocabulary and such. Uh, just try reading Shakespeare. You'll notice the language has changed a lot since the 15. 1600s. And, and so some people were concerned and they didn't like the fact that English was changing and the younger people were talking differently and not following the grammatical rules and so they started writing little prescriptive grammars and they were influenced by their preferences. These are my preferences for how English should sound like, what is proper formal English. And sometimes their preferences were influenced by Latin grammar rules like, you know, don't split infinitives and such nonsense. And even uh, at one point, Parliament kind of codified some, one of these uh, prescriptive grammars as standard English. Language is always changing, and then you've got different dialects. And this becomes a problem, for example, in minority kids, like African-American kids in schools with white teachers, and they look down upon the black kids because they're writing and talking in African-American English dialect, and maybe they are resisting speaking white. And so these kids might get disadvantaged. They might be held back or put into uh, lower level classes or such or face discrimination. So linguists believe in descriptive rules and all dialects have valid grammars. Each dialect might have a slightly different grammar including phonology or phonetics. And linguists consider these all valuable and we're studying and we would never engage in the sort uh, value judgment saying one is better than the other. Uh, that's kind of elitist. It's okay to have a standard language and to teach the standards of standard, say formal standard academic English writing and speaking if you want to succeed in academia or formal English if you want to succeed in business. That's one thing. But to say that other kinds of English are substandard or inferior, uh, that's wrong. Those are dialects or varieties and they're not wrong, they're just different. They're just different varieties and they're quite okay. So what makes a dialect? Maybe talk to each other for a minute. What makes a dialect? What are its distinguishing features? Okay, so what is accent? Yeah, intonation. So things like intonation, prosody. Di sometimes dialects vary in their intonational patterns. Okay, w expressions, words, idioms, vocabulary. Vocabulary, sometimes idioms too. Along with intonation, maybe other phonetic variations, phonetic variations, um, occasionally even phonological variations, uh, and occasionally syntax and morphology. Those are some common distinguishing features of different dialects. Most often speak about dialects in terms of like uh, those spoken by different native speakers. Um, occasionally we might talk about foreign accent in English too, and some of those have sort of dialect status. We'll talk maybe a little bit about bilingualism. How many of you are, were raised in a bilingual environment? Yeah, and actually, uh, that's not terribly unusual. Uh, at least half of the world, children in half the world are raised in a bilingual or multilingual environment. Sometimes Americans think it's unusual to learn a foreign language and they kind of are surprised when they meet people who speak and are raised in multiple languages. In fact, in Europe, there's an old joke. What do you call a person who speaks three languages? Trilingual. What do you call a pe person who speaks two languages? Bilingual. What do you call a person who speaks one language? An American. <laughs> uh, it's an old European joke. And that's, uh, apparently the UK also has kind of a similar problem, but Mer Americans are notorious. I mean, it's a big country. We think, oh, everyone needs to learn English. And, and of course, you can drive for like, you know, two days straight in, in the country and it's still the same country. But in Europe, you can like hitchhike and in, in another hour, you're in a different country in a different la or a different language region which is, I, I thought was fascinating when I um, spent a year, a year in Europe. And it's one of the reasons I uh, was motivated to study linguistics in grad school, just encountering all the different 
languages and cultures in Europe. It was fascinating. So uh, bilingualism is, is quite normal. Maybe it's a bit easier if two of your languages are re related. Cantonese and Mandarin are closely related. Swedish and Norwegian closely related. It's easy for one to learn the other. Dutch and German closely related. It's pretty easy for Dutch people to learn German. And of course, we have foreign accented English and where the differences may be due to well, phonology or phonetics. Phonotactics, like maybe some, t some consonant clusters are hard for some people to learn. Prosody, things like intonation and stress and such. Uh, sometimes our, uh, people can be sensitive about their accents. Sometimes people who speak English with a foreign accent might feel uh, looked down upon. But I mean, the fact that you speak a second language is pretty cool and you shouldn't let anyone look down upon you. Uh, in fact, if you consider, like, what's the number of people who speak English as a first or native language? It's not more than 600, 800 million. But the number of people in the world who speak, I mean, actually speak and you use English as a second language, I forget the number, it's more like one or two billion. There are more people who use English as a second language than people who speak it as a first language. So a majority of English speakers speak with a foreign accent, be it an Arabic accent, a Spanish accent, a Korean accent, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. But people can be sensitive. Some you know, people can be sensitive about accents. Uh, imagine you are an employer, you're hiring people, you're conducting job interviews. Would you ever maybe refuse to hire a person because they speak with an accent or a dialect, <coughs> whether it's foreign accent in English or it could be a dialect of the native English, like some kind of Southern English or Midland English or kind of Cockney British or something. They, they don't speak standard English, they just speak dialect. Do you think it would ever be okay to not hire somebody for a job? Uh, do you think there's uh, maybe some jobs where it will be okay not to hire somebody who speaks uh, in a dialect, in dialect or even foreign accent in English? Would that ever be okay? Most people are kind of either neutral or kind of agree what are some jobs where you think it might be okay not to hire a dialect speaker? Okay, somebody who's a, a, yeah, a commercial model, somebody who's doing maybe your commercials, you know, they so might want a, a person who can at least learn and speak the standard. So it depends on your audience. So sometimes you want to appeal to everyone and you want somebody who speaks standard. Do you all know country music? Uh, it's a variety of music in the U.S. Uh, it's, you associate it with kind of the southern U.S. It's a mixture of kind of uh, traditional folk and pop styles, uh, kind of cowboy music. And actually, I'll give you some famous country music song titles uh, later on in this lecture. They're kind of funny. If it's just a regular office job, would it be okay to not hire someone for speaking in a dialect? That would probably not be okay. This, uh, if, if, they're not going, if they're not hired to do like public speaking, that would probably constitute discrimination, dialect discrimination. So there might be a few cases where you really do need a, a standard speaker, or at least somebody who can learn and adapt to the standard. But in many cases, if it's just a regular office job, yeah, that would probably constitute dialect discrimination. And that is sometimes a pressure. Some American, some English speakers will have to learn because they want to get a better job. In my case, I grew up in Texas, and of course they don't sound like it. I grew up in a city, and maybe I had a mild urban Texas accent, and then, I kind of had unpleasant experiences in Texas with the political and religious culture, very, very conservative. And I started at a junior college, then I moved away to the Midwest. And I quickly lost my Texas accent, what I had, and I adopted a standard American English. Uh, now, part of the reason was I had been listening to British sitcoms on our PBS station since middle school and sci-fi like Doctor Who. And also in college, so I started to have a lot of international friends and uh, wanted to speak so they can understand me. So it, I guess even then I started to lose my mild Texas accent. But by the time I moved away, I didn't want to have anything to, to do with Texas. I mean, I think now as I look back, I appreciate some things about Texas culture or Southern US culture. But at the time it was for me sort of a stigma and I didn't want to sound like that. But I th think sometimes this dialect pressure or this pressure will motivate some people to either lose their dialect or they'll become bi-dialectal. They'll speak their home dialect when they're at home, but then they'll speak the standard when they're at work or when they are, if they moved away to another place, another location away from home.
But of course, a standard language is, I mean, who decides on the standard language? Standard English, well, standard British received pronunciation, or RP, is kind of based on Queen's English, and it tends to be very formal or posh, posh, like fancy and such. So a lot of educated people will speak something like that, RP or BBC English, and it's kind of influenced by Oxford English and Cambridge English, the uh, Queen's English and the BBC. So it's sort of a creation, and it's partly developed by, it was partly developed by maybe the upper class in Britain to distinguish themselves from the dialects of the lower classes. Uh, and that's part of the motivation, kind of elitist. And some British people will switch back and forth between their local dialects and then the uh, standard. Uh, in America, for if you watch older American TV shows and films, what you'll often hear, like stuff from a long time ago, the days of black and white films and TV shows, is a variety called Transatlantic English. And it was created by Hollywood so that American media would appeal to Americans and to British and other speakers. And it's kind of a mix or blend of between American standard American and British. So it sounds very much like New England English, uh, like educated New England English, transatlantic. And that kind of gave way over time to more of a standard American English that's also another media creation. And it's kind of similar to maybe urban educated Midwestern English, like an educated person in the Midwestern US. So if you imagine like, I don't have a map of the US, but you have like uh, New England, like Boston and such, and then then you have New York, and you have the East Coast. Then you have uh, mountain chain, Appalachian Mountains, and then kind of west of that might be Midwest, like Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, uh, into like Wisconsin, Minnesota, maybe even Iowa and such, that's kind of the Midwest. Uh, and so standard Midwest is kind of similar to the media standard, what we call standard American English. But it's more of a media creation, but I switched to that when I was in college and change some of my vowels, for example. So we talked about kind of number one, dialects tend to vary in phonetics, um, sometimes syntax, and lexis or vocabulary. The standard is maybe one variety that got elevated to standard status, and it's somewhat arbitrary. So it's somewhat elitist to kind of look down on dialects as inferior. In British English, standard Br British is sort of a media or upper class creation. Uh, in the US, standard American is sort of a media creation. In other countries, it's maybe based on the standard of educated speakers in the capital or the political, economic, cultural center. Seoul dialect is the basis of standard Korean. Beijing dialect is the standard of basis of standard Chinese or Mandarin. That's probably the case in many of your countries. The standard is probably based on the variety spoken by educated people in your political, cultural, economic center. A long time ago when mass media started to become popular, really a big influence in our culture, linguists started to think that mass media would kind of cause dialects to weaken in their influence. That doesn't seem to have happened as much. To some degree, yes. But in spite of the influence of mass media, in standard American or standard British in our media, dialects still remain alive and well. Why do you think that is? Why isn't that mass? So a couple of questions for you to talk for a minute. How do dialects first develop? Why do people start talking differently? Why do they develop and why do they persist despite the influence of mass media? That's true for English and that's true for other languages. So talk to each other for a minute. Why do dialects first arise and why do they persist even today? Geography is probably the biggest factor. I mean, lifestyle can be another thing, and lifestyle might affect your, your socioeconomic status and uh, whether you speak like the working class Londonish dialect or if you versus speaking the more um, standard British. Okay, so your lifestyle. If you're uh, part of the lower class, you know, your, your father is a, a truck driver, or in British they say a lorry driver. Lorry is British for a transport truck. So if your father is a lorry driver, or your mother is a waitress or something, you're probably going to speak Londonish or Cockney. And probably not so much standard received pronunciation. You probably first encounter that when you go to school. Geography is a big thing. And you'll probably, see, if you look at dialect maps of the US or England, you'll see different maps, different linguists would classify dialect, dialects differently. 
depending on what criteria they are using, but generally, for example, you'll see like New England English and East Coast English, then there's Southern English, then you might see Midland or Midwestern English, and then Western American, you know, for example, and uh, geography and geographical separation is a big thing. Appalachian English, the Appalachian Mountains, it's a mountain chain that runs through the eastern U.S. There are a lot of hill people and country people, rural, less educated people, and they stereotypically speak. A variety that's in some ways similar to the southern English, but also quite somewhat different and hard to understand, probably. So, your socioeconomic status, geography, those are big driving forces. Any other forces in the development of dialects? Okay, so language contact. Can you think of some examples? Okay, Quebec French, Quebecois. It's different, right? Uh, if a person from Quebec, or you may say Quebec, but there they say Quebec. If a French-speaking Quebecois person, Quebec person goes to Paris, what do the Paris people think of their French? They look down on the Canadian French. They look down and think, that's bad French. Well, it's different, okay? It's been influenced by English and other factors. Uh, I grew up in Texas, and so in Texas, of course, uh, we have some of our own slang terms that are influenced by Spanish. First of all, in Texas, and to some degree in American English in general, some common Spanish greetings are part of our slang. You might say, hola, como estas, or something. Or when Arnold Schwarzenegger says, hasta la vista, baby, in the movies, we understand him. Like, goodbye, hasta la vista, see you again. And then in Texas, we have even more. So in Texas, a slang term for jail, huscow, and this is just in Texas as far as I know. Any of you Americans know this word, huscow? He's in the huscow? He's in the huscow. It's actually from Spanish, the Spanish word juzgado. So in English, southern U.S. slang, southwestern U.S. slang, huscow is a slang term for jail. It's from the Spanish word juzgado, which I think is a court, criminal court. So we have a lot of slang terms like, you know, slang terms like this in uh, Texas from Spanish. Okay, so language contact influences Spanish. Right now Spanish is the one language that's having more influence on the English language than any other. Why do dialects persist? In spite of things like education, where kids maybe go to school and they're exposed to the standard variety, in spite of education and mass media, dialects still persist. Why? Yeah, maybe, so in some cases, like some jobs, maybe you're you're pushed to use the standard at work, um, but at home you'll still probably speak in uh, dialect. Uh, and of course it's actually a good thing, I mean linguists like dialects, we don't want to see dialects die or get pushed out by mass media, we, we, we think they're fun, they're cool, and they're interesting and we don't look down on dialects, we think they're interesting. So people still speak dialects at home. It's a big part of your cultural identity. Um, so southerners sometimes feel defensive if like a white person in the north looks down on their English and they look down on white northerners and call them Yankees. The word, and of course, Yankee uh, outside the U.S. is a slang term for an American, but in the U.S., because of the history, southerners refer to white you know, people from the north as Yankees. It's an important part of your identity. I once had a professor in grad school. He was from Africa originally, and this was in Illinois. His children were black and going to public schools. And one day he, he says his daughter came home crying because his daughter was being bullied by the other black children because they said they were making fun of her because she, she talks white. She's speaking standard English, she's talking white and not talking black like the other black kids. Well, she's first generation American. And so she learned to speak black to fit in. It's part of black identity. African American English is part of the African American or black identity. And of course, they have endured generations of being put down, especially in the schools by white teachers and white school systems for their style of English. So it's a p kind of part of their cultural pride and their in-group identity. Of course, sometimes you have dialect continuum, so there's no clear boundaries. If you see like dialect maps again, different dialect linguists will have different dialect maps, for example, of American dialects and such, because they maybe choose different criteria. It's kind of hard to draw a line, say this is Southern US English and this is Midland English. I grew up in Texas and I always thought of my English as Southern, or our English as Southern, but then I see some English linguists who kind of treat it differently than other Southern dialects and they'll call it Southwestern or they'll call it Midland or something else. So there's kind of a continuum. Also among social groups, you know, there's kind of a continuum maybe from working class Londonish on up to standard British 
and then the ultra standard, the very posh, like if you want to sound like the Queen. And we'll particularly talk today about standard American and British and also a bit of African American. So again, dialects will vary, particularly in the phonetics and allophones, sometimes phonemes, as well as prosody and vocabulary, also idioms, syntax morphology. So let's look at grammar. So we can talk about Commonwealth English, that's UK, Australian, New Zealand English, Commonwealth. How many of you think it's okay to say the government are? Or do you think, oh, it should be the government is? Is, okay, in North American English, yeah, the government is. But in British or Commonwealth, it, and you hear this all the time in BBC News, for example. I started wa watching BBC News um, many years ago, and at first I thought, no, it's government is. They typically say the government are. The government are considering a new plan. Uh, the team are preparing for their match. The family are going. Why? It's kind of a collective noun. It's logically singular, but it has a collective meaning. So government, team, family, and Commonwealth English, those are treated as plurals, and that's normal. In African American English, some of this is probably in the book, uh, omitting the copula B, like she gone. She going to the store instead of she is going. Uh, omitting the S for third person singular verbs, he needs some money. Habitual, so using B for habitual, that be cold, meaning it's always cold. Like, oh, New York, New York, that be cold. They be buying coffee, like they're always buying coffee or regularly buying coffee. Double negatives, we ain't see nobody. Now some of these are also common in other white dialects. Double negatives are common in a lot of dialects of English in the UK and the US. Ain't, using ain't, using double negatives. Uh, you hear that in Cockney British English and a lot of dialects of, of British and American as well as in pop and rock and hip hop songs. And, and, and so African American English has had some influence on Southern US English. Southern US English is a mix of influence, uh, various influences, geographical separation, African American influences, and also of course Irish. A lot of Irish people settled and Scottish people settled in the Southern states in our history. And that had an influence too on Southern English. Uh, phonology, so the R, there are a lot of dialects, particularly in England, in the UK, and also in New England, like Massachusetts, Boston, where the R is dropped, what we call um, non-rhotic English. Ro Rho is the Greek R, so we call them non-rhotic varieties, where the R is dropped, where tuna can be a radio tuner, tuner a tuna, or a fish. And particularly in British, standard British, and a lot of British varieties, you drop the R and the vowel becomes longer. Door, open the door. There, her, here, bear. And it leads to some new diphthongs, double vowels that you don't have in American. And this is kind of common in Australian, some ver Australian varieties too. Australian, New Zealand, New Zealand, British. There are some varieties where you drop R's, but then you insert R's in other cases, it's kind of weird, like bacteria, bacteria. And oddly, my parents grew up in kind of northern Texas, what we call the panhandle. And only in one case is there R insertion. They have a normal R, they don't drop R's, but they have R insertion in one syllable, wash, washing. So you, you lived in Dallas. Did you ever hear people say wash, like I'm washing my clothes? Oh, okay, where was your grandmother from? So maybe it's kind of a Midland thing too. Uh, yeah, a few Midland, Midwestern dialects where I do this too. I don't hear it in Southeastern dialects, but my parents say Warsh, and the capital of our country is Washington, D.C. Just in that word. Sometimes the varieties that drop R's often, they'll insert R's to link words together. So where one word ends in a vowel and the next word begins with a vowel, they'll just insert an, an R for, to link the two words together, spar owner. So they'll drop R's in words like door, door, but then they'll insert R's. I guess they're kind of compensating. Oh, we dropped the R's, let's put them in somewhere else. I saw a film, uh, Law, and, Law and Order. And in Texas, we have an R that's so much stronger, the tongue is bent back a little more, it's a bit more retroflex. So there's a car, carrot, careful, core, cure, and wash. The, R, the tongue is bent back more than in the R in standard American English. Uh, in Dallas, did you hear this? Strong, that strong R. 
So it seems to be Texas, not so much the southeastern dialects, but maybe southwestern dialects or middle, some midland dialects. Not sure. In some varieties of English, not only African American, but white working class English in big cities, the dental fricatives become a D. So if you're in Chicago, you'll see these stickers on cars and signs that say the bulls or the bears. Why? It's their sports teams, the, bu the bulls, the bears. And they, they say the bulls is your favorite team, the bulls, the bears. It's a, uh, an African American English too, the dental fricatives become a D. To some degree, in American dialects, you hear this darker velarized L where the back of the tongue is kind of raised more, and it depends. You get more of it, especially in Southern US English, but to some degree in Midland English and other varieties, you'll hear it sometimes. So uh, maybe it's just at the end of a word, like instead of a clear L in bell, the back of the tongue is raised, and it's more like bell, bell, bill. Or if it's before a, a, another consonant, halk, bilk, or especially before a back vowel, ball, call. Instead of call, 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 fall. The back of the tongue is raised more for saying the L, the dark L. So it's maybe a little harder to hear if you're not used to it. Vowel nasalization, I heard this some in, my, in, in some southern accents, like uh, where I grew up. Camper, hand, hang, uh, hang. In some dialects, like some like African American dialects, a diphthong will be will be reduced to a monophthong, na. Uh, southeastern dialects do this, na. Uh, on the side, it's on the side. How much do you, how much do you lack? How much do you lack? The southeastern U.S. How much do you lack? Uh, would you like that on the side? Would you like that on the side? Or bo, like uh, African American bo. The o comes in o. Oh, hey bo. Hey, bo. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, the B, the, where the ow becomes an ah. Uh, I've heard that a lot in Southeastern. I know, for example, uh, I had a Korean friend who was working in Nashville in the Southeast, and she had trouble at work understanding people because they would say, like, how much do you lack? Huh? Lack? Not lack, but like. Vowel variations. So the O vowel in maybe posh or standard British becomes an O. But also in some southeastern U.S. dialects, maybe the Carolinas, I'm not sure. We're going home. We've got to go home on the road. Turn on the motor. And not unusual. About in kind of Ontario or Quebec Canadian, Eastern Canadian, it's like about, about. So it's something that Canadians are stereotypically known for. About. A bit more of an oo sound in about. It's about, about the house. In some dialects, like in the first part of the ow, the vowel might get raised to an a ah or an e. Eh. So, and this occurs in a lot of dialects, some southern dialects and British, di southern U.S., various British dialects. Ha house, house, about, ra round, round, round. So the first part is more of an, and also Australian dialects too. For the first part, is not an, it's not an ow, but more of an ow, ow, house or even in some southern dialects, eh, house, house, house. Scottish, they tend to round some vowels, like the oo, you know, like boot. Like put on your boots, your snow boots, and house, I'm going to the house, there's a rounded vowel, house. And also in uh, some dialects, they drop the H's. Uh, so uh, in The Simpsons, one of the characters is the school janitor, groundskeeper, who's Scottish, and so Bart Simpson is looking for his dog, and he asks groundkeeper Willie, have you seen my dog? He says, yeah, I ate, I ate the dog. He's like, what? And then he realizes how he's trying to say, I hate the dog, not I ate the dog. But the dropping H's, uh, that happens in Scottish and other dialects. Southern drawl. So uh, this is what I grew up with, uh, Texas Southern, U.S. dialects, and Southwestern. Drawl is something that the Southern dialects are famous for. And that's from, one, the intonation is kind of more sing-songy and drawn out. It makes the vowel sound longer. But also, um, monophthongs will get diphthongized, especially with a schwa and uh, or a diphthong will get triphthongized and drawn out more. So even in maybe Midland or Midwestern dialects, you'll hear it like in number one before an L, drawl. Ball, ball, ball. It gets drawn out, kind of a uh there. Ball, ball. Y'all. Um, y'all is you all, plural you, y'all. Camper. And of course, with the nasalization, we're going to buy a camper. Give me a hand. 
hand, so especially southern dialect, hand. So it's nasalized, and you've got that drawl, the diphthongization, triphthong, or glide, a schwa glide, or, or something, an extra vowel glide. Hang, hang, you know, gotta hang it, hanging on the wall. Country music song titles. Oh, how come your dog don't bite nobody but me? These are real country music song titles. I want to whip your cow. What? <laughs> I'm just a bug on the windshield of life. Mama, get the hammer. There's a fly in Papa's head. <laughs> I don't know where to kill myself or go bowling. Whoa, well, yeah. That's, hmm. How can I miss if you won't go away? I really heard this song when I was young. I'm going to hire a wino. A wino is like a drunk homeless person. I'm going to hire a wino to decorate her home. And uh, my favorite, you're the reason our kids are ugly. Look it up on YouTube. That's a really funny song. It's by uh, Conway Twitty and uh, a famous female country singer. I can't remember her name. Vocabulary, some differences. We, don't, we lost our, our plural pronoun for you. So English used to actually have a difference. We used to have in English for singular, thou is for the subject and the was for the object, for you, singular. But what you had in England was a situation kind of like in French. So in French, the singular informal is tu in French, and the plural, you, plural is vous. But the vous is also used for formal address, whether it's singular or plural, vous is formal. And that was a situation in English you know, up until like the 15, 1600s in England. Thou was singular informal. What's thou like? What's thou like a cake? And the plural or the formal was you. You is either you singular or plural formal, as well as just the plural. So you is plural, but also if I'm being formal, I would say you. And ye was the, either the object or a directed dress form. But what happened was, apparently they just started calling everybody you. They started being formal to everybody, I guess. It spread into f informal context, the you, and then the thou and the got lost. So we used to have this distinction. So English has lost uh, the distinction between singular and plural. So different dialects have made up their own words for a separate plural. So in many colloquial varieties of English, we say you guys. And some people don't like that. That's kind of uh, sexist, it's not gender neutral. In the South, you all or y'all, I'm quite used to that. If I'm visiting my parents, I will say y'all, it's fine. Southeastern dialects or Appalachia and such, they'll say you ones, or they'll contract it to yuns or yuns. In British, they sometimes say you lot, which sounds pretty cool. Would you lot like a new homework assignment? Or would y'all like a new homework assignment? So that's a grammatical difference in different dialects. Some differences between American versus Commonwealth. In American English, we say, or North American, we say apartment. In British, they say flat. How many of you are used to saying flat for an apartment? Carry. carry if you're talking about carrying something heavy in Southern, like in Texas, we say lug, lugging around a, a big heavy book bag. Or in New York, they'll say schlep. I'm schlepping around a heavy suitcase. This is an influence of Yiddish on New York English. Yiddish is a language spoken by Jewish people in New York, and so there are, in New York English, so there are a lot of Yiddish words like, oi vey, like, like, oh gosh, oi vey. I've heard that in British dialects, oi. Soft drink in different parts of the English speaking world. Uh, how many of you would say normally soft drink? Those of you who speak English or have lived in the English speaking world, soft drink. How many of you would say soda? How many of you would say pop? How many of you would say soda pop? Or how many of you would just say Coke as a general term for soft drink? So I'm used to saying soda, but if I'm in Illinois, I'll say soda. But if you just drive maybe a few hours in, I don't know, maybe Ohio or something, then I might say pop. In Texas, it is normal to say Coke, maybe with a small, like maybe with a small C, Coke for a soda. So I go into a restaurant, what would you like? Oh, Coke, oh, what kind? We have Coca-Cola, Dr. Pepper, 7-Up, you know. Cheap building material, I don't see any here, but uh, it's kind of like a chalky material for walls and buildings. In Texas, we call it sheetrock, but I moved to the Midwest and uh, nobody knew what that was. Everyone says drywall. Apparently, that's more common in, in English, drywall. It's kind of a important, and this is kind of bad language, but we should be aware of this. What does pissed mean? Particularly in American English, it means very angry. So it's from a, a, a bad word, meaning to urinate. 
In American English, pissed means I'm angry, pissed off. But in Commonwealth, like British, Australian, what is it? It might mean that, but more often, what does it mean? If, like, oh, he's really pissed. Went to a party, got really pissed. Drunk. Again, it's not polite language, so I'm not advocating you should say this to your parents. Oh, yeah, hey, mom, I got pissed last night. What? But it, it's drunk, pissed. Went to the bar and got pissed. Went to a bar and got totally pissed. And this is an important difference. So taking a piss means to urinate. Taking the piss is a British expression meaning what? Like, are you taking the piss out of me? So just taking the piss can mean, uh, oh, I'm just joking, just goofing around, or it can also mean like making fun of somebody, uh, especially if you say taking the piss out of somebody. Are you taking the piss out of me? Like, are you making fun of me? Are you mocking me, making jokes about me? This is kind of a vulgar language, but it's important to note. These are important dialect, these are important distinctions. Very different meaning between taking a piss and taking the piss. And you hear this in British TV shows a lot. The British are not as conservative as Americans might tend to be about using such language. Isoglosses, so you can look at dialect maps, and this is just one. I so an isogloss is kind of like a dialect map based on either phonetic features or maybe vocabulary usage features. Like, this is where they say soda, this is where they say pop. This is kind of one is isogloss map, uh, kind of a, this is kind of a dialect map. And again, different linguists will classify dialects differently. So this is just one, you have South. Uh, other linguists might call this Appalachian English and make it a different category. Uh, I guess this is Midland or South Western English. I've never heard of North Central. This is just one dialect map, and this is not maybe the most common one, but I guess they're using a few linguistic criteria to come up with their own classification. You've got New England, North, Northeastern, New York, Midland. But a lot of dialect maps will be somewhat different from that. Accent maps. Here's a real, isoglos a real dialect map of England. In England, kind of like the south, uh, it's pretty much stuff that's kind of south of, kind of London, and the rest is kind of north. Then you've got Scottish and you've got Irish. There are different Scottish and Irish accents too. Liverpool is kind of here. In Liverpool, there's a variety called Scouse. So I went to Liverpool once for a conference. And I remember like a, at a conference banquet, the server, maybe a young lady, I was looking at maybe, can I get the pie or this pie or that pie? And she was telling me, it's one per person, like one pie per person. But it's, it's one per person, per person. Per person, so the er becomes an er per person. And that's not unusual in some British dialects. Here's a, uh, it's a kind of a little crustacean that's common. So in the, it's kind of a small crustacean animal, it's something that we uh, eat. It can be called a crawfish or a crayfish or crawdad, like in some Midland varieties, a crawdad. Here we go. William Labov is probably one of the most famous researchers of American and, and English dialects. He passed away a while ago. Maybe a decade or two ago, but his research team has done a great deal of work on, on dialects and even compiled a big dialect dictionary of, of English. Um, this is the pin-pen merchant. So I grew up in, so pin and pen are usually different vowels, but I grew up in Texas where it was always pin. So the e eh before an, a nasal consonant like in or im in short words was an i. So a writing pin and then a straight pin. Uh, and then I moved to the Midwest and learned to say a writing pen and a straight pin, pin, pen, like for writing. But in Texas, they sound the same, uh, pin, pen. Ah, uh, so the ah uh in caught, C-O-T, and the ah uh in like caught. Uh, I grew up in Texas again where we didn't have the ah uh vowel. We didn't have this. So instead of this, we would say ah, uh, or so caught. Then I moved to the Midwest and I learned to say, oh, caught. I caught, I taught a class. I caught a fish. So in, in some varieties, you don't have a distinct oh in American English. I'm not going to try to imitate African American or um, Chicano. I don't want to sound disrespectful because I know I can't do them right. <laughs> do you have uh, any other observations about dialects in, in English or dialects of your language? OK, using the F for milk and pillow. Yeah, interesting. OK. Do you know of any uh, about Korean dialects? Because it's been a while since I've learned about or studied Korean dialects. Anybody know about the features of Korean dialects? I know that Seoul dialect has kind of, there used to be kind of a distinction between long and short vowels in Korean, which is pretty much lost, especially in Seoul dialect. But I think, don't some Korean dialects keep a distinction between long and short vowels? 
I'm somewhat familiar with Chinese dialects and varieties, and the noticeable changes, of course, tone systems can be different in different Chinese dialects or even different varieties, things that we call different languages like Cantonese. Mandarin has like four tones. Cantonese has like eight or nine tones uh, that are distinctive. That sounds kind of hard to me, learning eight tones and such. There are some, for example, in Mandarin, there are some fricative consonants like ji qi shi, which get lost in some of the dialects of Chinese. And so, the, uh, for example, in the, uh, the Fujian, uh, Tai Yu, or tai, uh, Taiwan dialects, you know, Fujian in the mainland, um, they don't have those uh, fricatives and affricates, the palatal alveolar, like ji qi shi. So when I was in Taiwan, I don't know, some old lady tries to say to me, xie xie, which is thank you, but she doesn't have those sounds in her Tai um, Yu or Taiwan, a Taiwan accent. So she says, say say, <laughs> say say, instead of xie xie. Uh, uh, thought that was cute. It took me a while to figure that out, what she w why she was saying that. Uh, Chinese is known for a lot of, uh, uh, constant differences and tone differences in different dialects. Talk a little bit about bilingualism. Those of you who are to some degree bilingual, do you do code switching? Like you're speaking in one language, but then you sometimes switch to the other language. Or you say words in, like you speak one sentence in the language, but you throw in words from another language. It's called code switching. You do that a lot? Okay, you wanna give an example? So you can switch like, it could be just one word, you switch to one word, or it could be like a whole phrase or even like half a sentence, you know, or switching between one sentence in the language and another sentence in another language. When I was, for example, in Germany, I was studying in Germany as a foreign student, and I would say, uh, what did you do today? I went down to the Hauptbahnhof. Well, Hauptbahnhof is the main train station, but it's kind of like the center of the downtown. So it's kind of unique, so I would say Hauptbahnhof instead of main train station. I went to the Arbeitsamt, which means the uh, employment office, to get my Arbeitserlaubnis and, and the work permit because I wanted to work a part-time job while I was in Germany. So why do we do that? I don't know, just like, it feels different, right? So it's like, I could say main train station, but it's just different. It has a particular feel or distinctive meaning. Arbeitserlaubnis, work permit, well, it just sounds different. If I say work permit in English, it sounds, well, it's not the same as like, the Arbeitserlaubnis in German because it's maybe a little different how these things work. So I say my Arbeitserlaubnis, so I could work a part-time job there. Yeah. There's actually a whole field of study in code switching, the particular social context in which people do it, why they choose to cho switch certain words or phrases. And something I haven't studied, although I know maybe some friends, some colleagues who have actually done uh, a lot of research on it. There's quite a bit of research on code switching, particularly in English. Friends of mine, for example, who are Korean graduate students at Illinois, they had kids, so they studied code switching, made their kids. Sometimes if you're a foreign student, you have kids, yeah, study your children. It's a good PhD dissertation. And by the way, when I had my son, I decided I'm not going to study him. I never collected linguistic data from my son, per se. Uh, I didn't want to make him a research project. <laughs> I just wanted to enjoy my time with him. So, but I will give examples of his phonology maybe in a couple of weeks. The question I'll leave you with, uh, those of you who are bilingual, maybe we'll talk about this next time. When you speak one language or the other, do you feel different? Okay, we'll start with that next time because it's kind of an interesting effect. All right, see you later.